Winning Cures Everything. Now for your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in. We are live, but not. <laughs> I was just about to say, is this a live one? No, 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 no. We are, we are recording, and this is the Friday, March 26th episode for Winning Cures Everything. Hey, by the way, this is episode number, I believe, 790 at this point, or 789, one or the other. I was curious if you were keeping count. I, uh, I went back yesterday and, and double-checked it and was like, how many of these have we done? And, and yes, we are at like 789 or 790. I can't remember which. We did very few when we first started. Like everybody, we were like once a week, dragging ass. And then, and then we, we got realized, into hey, let's do this. If we're going to do it, yeah, let's, let's do, do it right, damn it. You are correct about that. I'm Gary, by the way. And I'm Chris. For anybody that has not by listened the, before. By the way. <laughs> For the first time, listeners, you know how it goes. There you go. You know how it goes. So this is our Sweet 16 Picks episode. We have some other things that we will discuss as well. Uh, but we do this every year. Uh, obviously, we did not get a chance to last year. But uh, but we do have a lot of fun with it. And it is one of our higher rated shows. We wanted to make sure we got our picks out. Um, I don't know that we're going to be any good at them this year. Because, my God, it's been insane. But we are going to have fun with it. And I am betting my own money on every single game. I've done okay so far. Uh, now, I haven't bet every game of the NCAA tournament, but I will every game on this one, on the Sweet 16. Uh, Ooh, but we, yeah, I'm probably going to have a little something on all of them. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's the fact that we don't have two games going at the same time uh, for any of these this go-round, it's, it's on Saturday and Sunday, and you got four games back to back to back to back. Oh, I'm, my Saturday's going to get ruined. What happened on Saturday? We're going to have thunderstorms on Saturday. Yeah. I got direct TV. Oh, so you know yeah. I'm not going to have any of these damn games. Well, hey, just download the uh, the March Madness app. Very simple Might to do. do. Yeah. So. <laughs> My internet will still roll. Oh, you got that right. Since you got that nice, fast internet, you, uh, you won't have any problems with that. So your internet will be fine. You will be okay. Everything will be good. Hey, uh, trust me, you can find the games if you need to. So uh, before we get started with that, First things first, winningcureseverything.com is the website. Everything you need to know about us can be found over there. We've got a new layout. It looks nice. It looks fresh. All that good stuff. So go and check it out for us. We would certainly appreciate that. Anywhere that you want to be subscribed, you can find there as well. All the different links. Uh, Our live shows Monday and Wednesday. We do on Facebook, Periscope, uh, Twitch, and YouTube. So make sure that you are subscribed to the YouTube page, which if you're watching this, that is where you would be watching it. If you are listening to it, that would be the subscription on the podcast. Whichever podcast app you like, Apple Podcast is our most listened to one. We have people on Spotify now, Amazon Music. Our iHeartRadio listens are going up. I was surprised by that, but but look at the numbers. Leave the review on the Apple one, though. Even if you don't use Apple, go log into Apple, hit the subscribe button, cost you nothing, and then say something nice about us and put five stars next to it. We would would certainly appreciate that. That would certainly help. So you can say thank you. You got that right. So, knock all that stuff out, and then, of course, sbrpicks.com slash NCAAF. That is our college football gambling show. We do once a week. It's not just gambling. We talk everything that has to do with college football. There's no FBS games going on right now, but there are FCS games. We talk about those. We talk about all the news with the Power Five conferences and the small conferences and everything else. All the stuff that's going on with transfers and guys that are getting hurt and coaches leaving and all and everything else. We discuss it right there. So go and make sure that you are subscribed on their YouTube page. You just search out SBR Picks on YouTube. Very easy to find. Or just right here on the Winning Cures Everything YouTube page, we've got it on our college football playlist. Very easy to do as well. So you can find that right there. Um, Chris, Lon Kruger decided that he was going to retire today. Did you see that? Yeah, I did. I did. He, how, he was at Oklahoma for 35 years? No, 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 no. Uh, he, he was only at Oklahoma for, uh, let's uh, see. Yeah. Uh, he, so he had a 45-year coaching career. Uh, he okay, was 45 he's, years he's been coaching. Yeah, Sorry, he he's, finished at Oklahoma. He's been at Oklahoma for I the last 10. Yeah, I knew he'd been there for a long time. I knew he wasn't there for the whole time. I, I don't know why I said that, but yeah. Okay, so it's 45, not 35. All right. You got it. He yeah, does, he's done years. this for a while now. I guess it's okay. I guess he's earned the right to hang it up and retire. Oh, most certainly. His son just got the head coaching job at UNLV. Uh, there you uh, go. Kevin Kruger. Um, so go he, move to Vegas, hang out, watch you your boy it. coach. That's, and and hang out fun. with the grandkids. That's what he said yeah. when, he, when he announced he was retiring. He said, I'm going to go 
hang out with my grandkids. Like, well, look, 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 you know what? We get, we should all hope for that life one day. You got that right. You've got that right. So here is how he started. He was an assistant at Pittsburgh State, an assistant at Kansas State. And then he took over the Texas Pan American job. He coached at Kansas State for four years, coached at Florida for six years, coached at Illinois for four years, got the Atlanta Hawks job and coached there for three years. He was an assistant coach with the Knicks for one season, went back to UNLV for seven years, and then was at Oklahoma for the last ten. He made two Final Fours. He took five different programs to the NCAA tournament, and there are only two other coaches that have done that, and that would be Tubby Smith and Rick Pitino. Pretty crazy. If Tubby could have gotten Memphis there, he'd he'd be at six. Tubby was a long way from getting Memphis there, brother. He was. He was. Uh, he's at high point now, and and I think, you know, give him another year or so, and I no. think that he can have them there. No. So, well, a conference like that is is more uh, about the X's and O's and the coaching. And, what, and I, so I trust Tubby Smith Let me ask you this. How much coaching do you think he's doing? Because he was sleeping in Memphis. I mean, that's a good point. Well, it, it, his sleeping had to do with recruiting. No, no, he was on the he was on the bench. Uh, that's true. Off yeah. During games, man. That's a, that's a good point. I was shocked a, that he took another job after Memphis. Well, high points your fact that he just but, didn't seem like he had any fire in him at all. High point is is where he graduated from. That's that's um, fine. That's fine. I'm just telling you that. Here's here's what Tubby did. Uh, let's see, two years ago he went 16 and 15 at high point in his first season. Not bad. Then went nine and twenty three last year. He went nine and fifteen this year. So maybe maybe I'm incorrect about that. Going backwards, <laughs> he's definitely going backwards. Going backwards. Here. So going backwards. Yeah, maybe that sixteen and fifteen was from the other guy. Yeah, yeah. I, you might be Got right. A bunch about of that. seniors. I'm gonna bet there's not a lot of one and duns at high point. I'm gonna I'm gonna bet there was a lot of seniors on that team that went fifteen and sixteen or sixteen and fifteen. Let's see. The year before he, he got there, five hundred in two years. Scott Cherry was the head coach before him. He went fourteen and sixteen, fifteen and sixteen, twenty-one and eleven, twenty-three and ten. So Scott uh, Cherry has done what? So what he did his first year to, as Tubby was exactly what Scott had been doing. Uh, pretty much, pretty All much. Right. Yeah, I'll that's that's what it sounds statement. like. Tubby's asleep. So, but back back to Lon Kruger. Um, I mean, just a fantastic, fascinating career. He's participated in 17 NCAA tournaments. Um, he made a Final Four with Florida. He made a Final Four in 2016 with Oklahoma. You remember the whole Buddy Heald thing? And all of the college or college basketball media have been all over the fact that at Oklahoma, his practices were always open. Always yep. open. And his reasoning for that, when people would ask, he said, I got nothing to hide. I got, I got nothing. Like, you want to see what we're doing? You can come in and see it. We're not running trick plays here. Yeah, and they didn't have to. They were always well coached. They no, always they played, played, played discipline. Straight up basketball, and they just, they just out effort you. They outworked you. Yeah, it's. I, I'm, I'm excited that he gets the opportunity to, to go out the way that he wants to, and he gets no, to go and hang. Thing. You, yeah. you know, the downside is, is there'll be people say, "Well, he never really won the Pac-12 or the Big 12. Yeah, he didn't, but. I mean, he just happened to be in a conference with a monster. That's a blue blood. Oh, yeah. And, you know, there's nothing you can do with that. I mean, he won Big 12 Coach of the Year in 2014. Yeah. Um, he went to a Final Four. I mean, I just because you don't win the conference in, in basketball, I don't know that it necessarily matters, you know. But hang on. The fact that he made a Final Four, it's a big deal, right? Oh, very much a so. Final Four. So you don't have to win a championship, right? You can you can make it to a Final Four and say this is an amazing accomplishment for this school. <laughs> and, and wait a minute, yes. wait a minute. I didn't, yes. I didn't, I didn't think that's how the NCAA worked. I thought it was one champion, nothing else mattered. Um, no, no, okay. I, it's okay. it, there's there's more. I'm just, to making, it. I'm just looking for some consistency because because there's another sport where they only tell us if you can't win at all, you don't deserve to be there. So. Um, it was the 2016 Final Four, and in that Final Four, they were beaten by Villanova, 95 to 51. Do you remember? Yeah, but you remember that, that was that. Yeah, uh, uh, who was the point guard for Villanova? That was just unbelievable. Uh, it wasn't Suggs. What was the kid's name? It, well, yeah, I was um, about to say that was before Suggs. Uh, uh, hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm looking. Jalen Brunson, 2016. Brunson, Jalen Brunson. Yep. So that would uh that would be it. Jalen Brunson was the the kid. He was the one that that really kind of took it over. Josh Hart was there. Um, 
Chris Jenkins, he's a forward. Like they, Eric Pascal, uh, Phil Booth, Dante DiVincenzo, Ryan uh, Archie Don, Ar- Archie Dinacchio. I, man, I've screwed that up so bad. Was that Nova's first championship or second? That was that was uh, the first one, right? That was the first one. Yeah. That, I think that's the first one. Yep, that was the first one. So yeah, yeah. I mean, it, Villanova, you know. It killed everybody that year, pretty much. Yes, they, so, they were the best team on the planet. Most certainly. And that was the year that they uh, they hit the game winner, buzzer beater against North Carolina, you know, all that mess. So, uh, but yeah. That, final, yeah. that championship game was, I mean, I still remember so much about it. That oh. was an unbelievable game. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Uh, interesting point, and we'll talk about this with the Sweet 16 and whatnot. Syracuse made the Final Four that year as a 10 seed. <laughs> I, I remember that. I do remember that. Now they got smoked when they got to the final four, but they did make it. So. But they made it to the final four, man, as oh, yeah. a 10 seed. Exactly, which is just absurd. Absolutely that's what, that's absurd. That's what Syracuse does, man. So, of course, cheers to Lon Kruger on a fantastic career. We wish yeah. you the best. Enjoy your time with your grandkids good, and good hanging out. Li- uh lift, yeah. so. You got that right. He's only 68 years old. He's still got a long time left. But Oh, yeah, no, that's the nice thing is he's he's got – He's got time at the end of his life, hopefully, to to enjoy yes. these things that he wants to enjoy. You are correct about that. All right, so let's dive into these games. Uh, some of them we will spend longer on, some uh, not as long. But we will start off with the Saturday opener. I don't imagine that we will spend a ton of time on this because I don't know a whole lot about these teams. Uh, but 1.40 p.m. Central Time on CBS, Bankers Life Fieldhouse, Oregon State and Loyola. Oregon State, a 12 seed. Loyola, the 8 seed. Uh, Loyola, as of right now, you can find them at 6.5 or 7, depending on the book. And the total, around 125. Uh, look, th- this Oregon State team, I, I, can't, I can't look at numbers with them. They are playing completely differently than they did uh, for, these, for these last five games. This is a completely different team than what they were before. I don't know what happened. I've gone back to look and see, like, did somebody get healthy or did it? No, this team just gelled at the right time and they got hot. And I, I don't know what to make of it. I, I go, go ahead, go ahead. Tell me, so, tell so, me something. So I listened to I listened to Pat Forty. God, I can't tell you what show, uh, what show it was on. It was not on the Yahoo podcast. It was on a podcast where he goes on as a guest a couple of times a year, and he talked about the Pac-12 teams. And how was it a fluke? Did everybody same thing we had the conversation of is was the yeah. Big Twelve really overrated? Was the Pac twelve underrated? He he spoke about how for six months, six months out of out of the year, the Pac twelve schools couldn't go work out in a weight room. They couldn't get a basketball and dribble and work out on the, like they were on lock down lock down. All right. Out west. They were, uh, what was the phrasing they were used? Shelter in place. Yes. Okay. Which, which is a, which is a, a, a security threat statement. It's not a, it's not a, not a medical thing, but, but that is, that is get the helmet and bucker down. Okay. They did not live life like the rest of the, the country. So the fact that we all thought they weren't this good is a little bit of, they weren't that good then because it was still preseason for them. They were still going through the regular season and still playing catch up to where everybody else is. But now we've reached this point and they are in full swing. And he says, if we could back up everything six months and start the season now, he said that there's no doubt we would all think the PAC 12 is far better than it. When we thought originally they would be seated differently Everything would be viewed from the, a different scope of lens. He believed they were just so far behind the eight ball in working out and being physically in shape. Um, I mean, I mean, their their physical activities were anything they could do on their own, which is push up, sit ups. They weren't allowed in the weight rooms. They weren't allowed in the gyms, um, and and so they just came into the season not not physically nearly in shape or you know, having, having been able to, to run enough drills or do anything. And, and it just took them a while for their bodies and, and as a team to get acclimated. And now, now they're hitting, 
And this is why you're seeing Oregon play at the top of their game. You're seeing USC play the way we never thought they were going to play. And Oregon State is is clicking in a way in which no one expected. Um, I think that's a mark of good coaching. I do believe that uh, because not all the Pac-12 teams improved this much to this level. Um, but but also it's just a part of, of these guys, these kids, they're, they're six months behind everybody else. And so think of, you know, think of where Gonzaga was six months ago and what did we think of them, you know? We well, I mean, if, if you just look at it. We thought they were you, the best team in the country. Yeah, you look at Alabama and they were gelling at the end of January, early February. Yeah, yeah uh, three, yeah, three and a half months is. ago, yeah. we thought differently. And so now look at these guys. They're where Bama was then. They're where everybody else was. And, and I think that's why all the Pac-12 teams look just sub- substantially better um, now than, than we ever expected. Yeah, they now, just what does gelled that mean? at a different time. Yeah, what, what does that mean? Do I think Oregon State can beat Loyola? That's now, now we're getting to a point where we're picking a game, right? Correct. I, I honestly don't. I like this Loyola team a lot. Um, there's a world where I kind of want to take the points because I think it can be close. But Loyola's got a couple of guys that I think are going to be pros. And they've they're just a they they are a better coached basketball team. They they might be the best coached basketball team left in the damn tournament. By the way, agreed. No, that's outside eight, it, so of maybe Bayheim. Let's let's talk know. about uh let's talk about Porter Mosher for just a minute. Like it, okay, it, so the conversation has turned to if you're him, do you take DePaul? Do you take Marquette? Or do you take Indiana if any of those are offered? Um, or do you just stay at Loyola and build this thing into you know Gonzaga East? I. I'm all over the Marquette thing. Like, I think he could build a monster at Marquette. Well, and I think, Pete, you know, Pete like, Thamel from Yahoo is reporting, don't sleep on Marquette. Do yeah. not sleep on Marquette. They have the second highest basketball budget in the country. I thought it was third. Maybe maybe it is second now. Pete Pete said second in his article that he wrote about either yesterday or today. Um, and and it, he, he says they're they're number two in the country on what they spend on basketball. That is crazy, but that that, that is a basketball hungry school. Man, yes. They don't have football to to blow the money on. No, so now, I, he'd have to move. And right now, remember, so we've been we've been to to uh, Northwestern. Yeah, to get to Northwestern, you literally drive through the Loyola campus. They both sit right on the North Shore of Lake. It is some of the most beautiful land in the country. Yes. It is, it is one of the coolest, most beautiful places to hang out and to be. You're a stone's throw from Chicago, but you're far enough outside of Chicago to where you're kind of in your own little bubble. And and I I don't know that I'm leaving there to move to Wisconsin or I'm leaving there to move to, to Indiana. I like, like those schools might be bigger and those places might be better, quote unquote. But at some point in time, I got to look at where do I want to raise a family? And where are my kids going to go to high school? And where are we going to live? And I don't know if he's even got a family. I don't know anything about that. But I'm, but I'm just telling you, I, I would be cautious because I think, I think that job right down the road is going to come open at some point in time. Now they don't have a president. And they don't have an or an athletic director. So, um, but but I I think he could get a phone call and literally his commute be three minutes for, more than what it is now. So. He doesn't here's, have to sell his house. He agreed. doesn't have to pull his kids out of school. But look, here's the thing. Like, Milwaukee's only an hour and a half from Chicago. Like, You're it's not, not that far. though. You can't drive back and forth. You're not leaving the North Shore of Chicago for Milwaukee. I, I mean... You're not making that commute. You can't do that as a college coach. You just can't. No, you're you're right. You have but to be but what there. I'm saying is that it's it, you're not moving to another part of the country. Like you're you're moving an hour and a half up the road. Like if if it's yeah, but an hour and a half and, up the road, life is a whole lot different than on the north shore of Chicago. That's true. And the middle of Milwaukee. Not not bes- not now, besmirching I, I would the great love, state of Wisconsin, but come on, man. I would love for him to stay at Loyola and then take the Northwestern job. I would love that. That's I think what it'd be I a great want, selfishly. Fit. There's However, some selfishness in this. But but if you look at at Porter and and what he was doing, I mean, he was at, he was like a season away from getting fired at Loyola. Like he got fired at Illinois I State. I think that's gone. I think that's gone now. Well, I, I agree, but it's one this of those is, where is, even if he loses this Saturday, 
I think that's gone. Here, here's what he did at Loyola. He, he got the job in 2012. It took him five years after he got fired at Illinois State. He went 7-23 and 23 his first year, 15-16, and 10-22. and 22. Then he went 24-13, and 15-17, and 18-14. Uh, and 14. And then he made his first NCAA tournament and made it to the Final Four in 2018. 2019, they went 20 and 14. 2020, they, they went uh, 21 and 11. And there was no guarantee that they were going to make the NCAA tournament. And then this year, 26 and 4, and it seemingly on pace to make another Final Four, possibly. Right, they're in I a mean, good position. Final Four is a lot right now. We're we're Sweet 16, man. We're two two wins away from that. Right, but but what I'm saying, they've got a matchup where they are a seven point favorite against Oregon State to get to the Elite Eight, and then you play either Houston, who really doesn't scare you all that much, or Syracuse, who definitely doesn't scare you. So it, you've got it but set up just, pretty well. Let's just not counter chickens right now. If he, agreed. If he it goes out in the Sweet Sixteen, it was still a hell of a run. Oh, agreed, absolutely agreed. But but what I'm and saying he's not is not getting fired at all. He could be the coach there for the next decade. You might be right. You might be right. I don't know. I I just worried that this is somebody that's failed before, somebody that didn't get a chance at one of those big jobs. I mean, if I was him, I would take Marquette. Um, it, it would be well, Marquette I, I, or stay home. A lot of it is his money's got to talk. Okay, oh, and I'm 100%. sure Marquette's going to come with a lot more money than Loyola. Yes, but I don't know how much a lot is, and you know, we just like I said, man. I at some point in time, if you think you can win anywhere. What where you live has to matter. Now, if That's you true. can't win anywhere, then where you live doesn't matter anymore. Winning matters. I uh, I'm going to take Loyola minus the seven. So um, I, I am too. It scares me. I don't like laying the points. Like Ethan Thompson has been on fire for the Beavers, but I, I at some point this run of theirs, this magical mystery tour that they have been on, has got to come to an end. And I but trust. You don't think we can say the same thing about Loyola? No, because Loyola's played like this all year. Yeah, that like is true. they they that, make that, it look no, okay. so easy, right? No, you're exactly right. They they beat the hell that they didn't get a chance to play any quad one teams. Everybody they play, they beat the hell out of them. Yeah, I mean they, their losses. Um, they lost to Wisconsin early and, early, and they lost by by 14 points. But they lost by two to Richmond, who was a yep. pretty good team this year. Yep, they lost by five. Uh, at Indiana State back in January after they came off of a, a little bit of a pause. And and then they lost by one in overtime at Drake. That's it. Yeah. So at, this is the number one defensive efficiency team in the country. Their tempo is 342. Like, they play slow. They play smart. They are number nine in effective field goal percentage. They um, When they come out of a timeout, awesome. you, can, you can almost guarantee two points. Yes. Yes. Like, they are that well coached. They're going to run a play. They're going to draw a play up, and they're just going to beat you at it. But And it could be a play you know it's running. It doesn't matter. They're going to execute it to perfection. I've never seen a team with, you know, just standard athletes, all right? We're not talking about LeBron James and Dwayne Wade here, okay? We're talking about just your standard run-of-the-mill college basketball athletes. They execute to perfection. Yes. Yes, they do. Um, so I'm I'm gonna take the minus six and a half. That is where my book has it. Um, yeah. You uh you taking the same thing? Yeah, I'm taking the same thing. It scares me, but but the points I'm taking the same thing. I can understand it. All right, moving on, we will jump into the next game, and that would be uh 4:15 p.m. Central Time on CBS, and Villanova is playing against Baylor. It's the number five seed against the number one seed. Uh, it's at Hinkle, so. Obviously, great atmosphere for a college basketball game. Um, look, Villanova had to beat Winthrop and North Texas to get here. Uh, they're not going to be able to shoot 15 out of 30 from three uh, against Baylor. Like that, I just I don't see that happening. Um, Baylor, like as far as guards go, they are going to out guard uh, yeah. a, a, a Villanova like like crazy. I mean, it's Baylor shoots 41 and a half percent from three. They're number one in the country. Um, Villanova is number 237 in three-point efficiency defense. That is not a good matchup. Baylor's got three guards, Mitchell, uh, Butler, and Teague, that are going to take advantage of the fact that Colin Gillespie is out here. Against those other teams, Villanova could show out, and they could out-talent those guys. You're not going to out-talent Baylor. Like, Baylor is playing like the best team in the country right now, 
and I, I think that that continues here. I I trust Baylor. Uh, the odds right now, or not odds, the line right now is Baylor minus, ooh, it has jumped up a bit, seven and a half. I'm still going to take seven. it. And yeah, so, seven and a half. I would lay it as well. What do you think of the over at one forty one and a half? So, it, a lot of people are on that over. Um, I think I'd probably go over as well. Like I, 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 I expect too. points. I definitely don't have the balls to go under because I there's a world where Baylor just doesn't stop scoring. Yeah, I, I now, really think so. There, there, there's also a world where teams that live by the three also die by the three, and if for some reason there's just some weird ass something going on with their shot and there's a, you know, a lid on the bucket and they can't just make the ball go in the hole, then I don't know what to tell you that we've seen that happen in tournaments before. It's why it's scary as hell to, to bet against guys that shoot the three, yep. but it's also, you know, you know, scary as hell to sometimes to bet on them because you can, you'll know in the first five, 10 minutes of the game, uh, does a loser because if they're not scoring, it's over. Yes. So, um, but I, I think I would go over as well. I like Baylor. You know, you know, I like taking dogs. I can't. We're at the point of the tournament where I think dogs have covered so much and won so much. I, I think we're we're going to get real chalky. I thought the same thing. I, I think it's going to get kind of chalky from here on. Um, yeah. But that does mean that we're going to get some really, really good matchups. And I'm totally fine round. with that. Yeah. yeah. Elite Eight, Final Four, we're going to get some really, really good games. Uh, moving on to the nightcap. And... This one is, uh, I guess, interesting. Maybe. I, I It's 6, what, 6, uh, 25 p.m. Central Time, TBS, Banker's Life. Uh, Oral Roberts says the 15 seed, only the second 15 seed ever to make the Sweet 16. They are facing off against Arkansas, who is the three seed here. Um, Oral Roberts, they led Arkansas by 10 at the half back in December. They ended up losing the game by 11. Uh, I was about to say. <laughs> uh, look, O'Banner and... Uh, Abemus, they have been going off in this tournament. But I don't think that they have... Like, I understand that Florida has athleticism. They do not have the same players, the same no, dudes Florida, that Arkansas's got. Florida's not close to as athletic as Arkansas. And same with Ohio State, right? So those yeah. two wins, while they are incredibly impressive, Very they impressive. were both by the, the hair of their chinny-chin-chin, and I don't know that they're going to be able to... And it was, a it was different teams. I think Arkansas might be the most athletic team left in the tournament. I I think I could agree like with that. Just, just dudes that just raw athletic talent. This now, team's scary. There's a reason I had them going to the finals. Is And I know that's a long shot, but I just – they could also lose this game because they play so weird. Well, And, and they're um, really young, right? We've talked about yeah, that well, multiple yeah, times They make mistakes. Year. Now, the young yeah. part doesn't bother me because it's college basketball. Hell, before this year – Everybody's been young because every winner's just full of one and duns. Well, so what the hell does that mean? Some are full of one and duns. Like Virginia was not like it, to to win the tournament. Virginia, uh, Nova, that they weren't. But every Kentucky team that's won, every North Carolina team or Duke team has a ton of one and duns. I mean, Kentucky under Calipari has only won one, but they have okay. made Final Fours. So that's, North I'm, Carolina and Duke have won a lot. Yeah. And they're full of nothing but one and dones. I mean, come on. I I think there is some experience that matters here. Uh, but I, I will I will say this. The reason why we're even talking about this game is because of the spread. Like I, we both expect Arkansas to win this game rather handily. The ultimate equalizer is can they beat them by eleven, which is what they beat them by last time. Exactly. I don't think there's any world where Oral Roberts is up by ten in this game that Arkansas has to come back and fight. There is a world where Arkansas beats them by twenty. I I do agree with you. Um Man, so You're here's here's points? here's here's where I'm I'm questioning. Okay, uh, Oral Roberts number one in three point. Uh, sorry, free throw percentage in the country, eighty one point four percent from the line. They're number fourteen in the country in three point percentage. And if you look at Arkansas, um, you know, not not great against the three at all. Uh, let's see, they are da -da -da, number one fifty in three point efficiency defense. I I still think that they could. They could possibly run them out of the gym. They're not gonna. These are two different. This is talking. You're talking about styles and fights, man. Yeah, you're talking about styles and fights. Yes, Oral Roberts has shot really well against the three, and Arkansas hasn't guarded well against the three. The teams that beat them by the three are far better than Oral Roberts, that and the true. team that Oral Roberts is dropping those threes on are not nearly as good as Arkansas. 
That is a that's a valid. Okay. I told you that every year we have somebody come out of the woodworks that we didn't know their name, and they're going to be a star. I think that person could be Moody. I agree. Yeah, Moses right, now, Moody for sure. Now he hasn't been so spectacular up to this point to where everybody knows his name, but everybody in the SEC knows his name. Oh, for sure. And the two teams that they've played knows his name. I, I, I we're getting to a point as the field shrinks down, we're going to start. We're going to start learning the names of stars that we didn't know. And, and I think he's going to be a household name by the time this game is over. Against Colgate, it was uh, Devontae Davis had 23 points. Or, sorry, uh, had 12 points. Uh, Justin Smith had 29 points against Well, yeah, Colgate. therein lies the problem um, is, is, yeah, they've kind of shared the ball, and everybody's kind of had a different different guy take over each game. Now, you've uh, you've got that right. And then Justin Smith had 20 points against uh, Texas Tech. So, uh, but Moody had 15 points and and was an absolute stud. So, you know, I I think I'm going to roll with you. I think Arkansas just too too many dudes. I don't I just don't like laying dudes. that many points, but there is a world where I think that's the floor. If Or Roberts covers this game, it's going to be by one or two. They beat him by ten or nine. There's a world where if Arkansas covers, they double it up. Yeah, yeah, you might be right about that. You might be right. So, and, and back then, like, when they played... How many guys it, is Oral Roberts going to put on the court? That's what I need to know. How deep are they playing right now? Uh, it, Like, eight guys. Okay, yeah. See, and I don't think I, that's I enough. Think by, I think by the time we get to the second half, those those the five starters are going to just be so gassed it won't matter. You might be right. Because I think Arkansas is going to... Arkansas and LSU play almost identical basketball. So, we have taken nothing but favorites. We're, we're changing right that here. I... Well, you might. We're changing that here. All right, let's uh, let's move on. Last game on Saturday, and that would be 8.55 p.m. Central Time tip. Late game on TBS at Hinkle. Syracuse as the 11 seed going up against number two Houston. We get a nice matchup of Jim Beheim against Kelvin Sampson. Now, this is the best cozy matchup in the tournament to this point and maybe in the tournament overall when it's all said and done. Can you think of a more fun coaching matchup? I mean, Bayheim against Huggy Bear was was fun, but yeah, Huggy that Bear was a hell of a game. Seemed set on the, he he didn't get into it. He sat on the bench and he got pissed off a yeah. lot. Yeah, now this this he will did, definitely be. He was not be. the Huggy Bear I, I I normally love. Now you're right. He he was this whole season. He's been kind of out of it. But I, I wonder if that has to do with the COVID stuff and whatever else. No, I don't know that he's worried about COVID at all. Well, no, <laughs> he no, no. Like I, the I guy just it's least afraid of things. I, um, I don't. I don't know that he's afraid of. It. I think he's just. You know. I, I think this has been a hard year. I do know that his team was better than it has been in the past, but it's different. He's never had a team that was that offensively good, but they also were a lot not nearly as good defensively as he's used to. Well, let me. Let, all right. So let's talk about this. Uh, Syracuse. How have they been winning? Three ball and defense. So let's talk about that. San Diego State, number one seventy five, three point efficiency defense. West Virginia, number 151, three-point efficiency defense. And this is on the season. Houston yeah. is number 12. Yeah. Houston has long dudes. They got big okay. guards. They got the long arms. They can defend. They are incredible at defending, and, and we have both seen that. Like They may not so, have played the same kind of schedule that Syracuse has, no. but, but they have played against zones that are very similar. No, they Tol- haven't. No, they haven't. They haven't played against anything that's similar to this. Uh, Tulsa, okay. Tulsa plays and now. They did take a loss to Tulsa, but they they have at least seen it, and they came back and they whipped Tulsa the next time. And Tulsa plays a very, very similar two three matchup zone to what Syracuse does. That's fine. Very Tulsa's similar. Not nearly as long as Syracuse is either. Agree. Agree. So so let so so I've watched all these Syracuse games. I've watched every second of them. You know where they hit most of their threes in transition. Yes. When they make a defensive play, they don't run down and get set up and then shoot threes. They run down and they post up and they shoot it. Pop, yes. pop, real quick. There's no length that can stop that. Now, if they get down there and Houston doesn't turn the ball over and they can cut through the the the, the zone and they can score, then it's fine. But if Syracuse continues to get transition. They get extra takeaways, extra positions, and they score on transitions. That you, there's no defense for that. Agree. The, the best defense for that is when teams go down to dunk or to to lay it up, and you block it off the backboard. That's that's the only defense for a team 
breaking away in transition, all right? Or you got to somehow have numbers, which you rarely ever have. You get down there and you take a charge. They're running down, and then they're stopping and just shooting, pulling the trigger, bam. Quick releases, firing shots off. You can't really play defense against that. Agreed. However, you can you can stop that from happening, and the way that you do that is... By not turning the ball over? One, you don't turn the ball over. They are number 32 in the country at not allowing steals. They are number 50 uh, on offense as far as turning the ball over, which is pretty good out of 350 however many teams, right? Yes, um, that, so all those things are good. fine, the, Here's the other part. they're not playing teams that do this. Agreed. Hold on, hold on. Here's, here's the other side of it. Offensive rebounding. If you have a team that attacks the glass when they miss a shot... Houston is number two in the country in this metric. So I I think Houston can stop all of those transition buckets. Okay. I'm I'm all over Houston on this spot. I, I think that Minus they are the points. they are a bad matchup for Syracuse. Okay. So I, I trust Syracuse, Kelvin Sampson. I'll take Buddy. I'll take the points. Totally fair. Totally fair. I, I think, think they're gonna win the game outright. I think Houston uh had a bad matchup with the Ruggers. And I think they got their bad game out of the way. Uh, what I am curious about is uh, Jero. Is is he is he still dealing with the hip injury? Is he going to be you know bad or whatever? This would be a really good game, by the way, for uh, uh, for Sasser to get going from three. Like he's going to have to hit some some open jumpers. Um, Grimes, I'm not worried about. I think Quentin Grimes is going to be able to hit whatever he wants to, because obviously against the a two three matchup zone, they're going to have open looks. It's just can you knock them down? And, and I think they can. Because Syracuse is not going to run you off the three-point line. Houston will have to hit open shots. And I, I trust them to be able to do that. So, um, let's move on from there. I, oh, oh, so I'm taking... I didn't even talk about the line. Uh, it is currently at six and a half. Yep. I'll take Houston minus the six and a half. All right. So, and I'll, you... I'll take Syracuse plus the points. I think Syracuse can win the game. Plus 235. So... That's what I was going to say. It's a, you're going to put a little on that uh, on the money line, huh? Oh well, yeah. If you're going to bet a dog in the tournament, you need to you need to sprinkle some on the money line. May as well. May Might as well. well. All right. Moving into the Sunday slate, we have got the 1:10 p.m. Central Time tip. CBS Hinkle Creighton as the five seed against Gonzaga as the one seed. Uh, there's not a lot to say about this game. Look, it, Creighton is Gonzaga light. They play almost the exact same way, yep. but Gonzaga has. Uh, the better player at basically every position. Everything that Creighton likes to do, Gonzaga already does. The spread on this game is Gonzaga minus 13. I mean, it's a massive yeah, that's a number. a lot of points. Um, however, like, I, I... Look, I bet against Gonzaga the other day, and I thought I was going to be able to get them got with Oklahoma. And yep. and they were right there. I lost that I lost that bet by half a point. Half. A, I should have bought the half point, and then I would have just pushed... But uh, but I got greedy, and I said, "Man!" Uh, and of course, Oklahoma comes out hot. They are they are stroking it like it it looked great. Everything was good. Um, Mitch Ballack, the guard for for Creighton, he is kind of the X factor if he gets going because he will he will jump that thing from mid court, and and he can hit it, man. But the issue is he has to be on. He's incredibly streaky. Uh, that's about the only way that I feel like they can stay in this game. Zagorowski, like, I like him, but I think I think Suggs is better. Um, I just, I, I'm not going to bet against Gonzaga right now. Like, I think this is the best team, and, it, and it's not even close. Like, Baylor can do some things to maybe, uh, to slow that thing down and make it a ball game with Gonzaga, but I, I like the Zags, man. Like, I, I, I think they're going to cover this. Give me, give me Mark Few, minus 13 points, and, and I don't, I'm not even worried about it. I think they're going to cover. I got to – I don't want to do this, but I think I'm going to take Creighton in the points. It's scary as hell. It's just a lot of points. I think Gonzaga's the best team. I don't think it's close either. But 13 points is a lot in the tournament. I think Creighton's going to play their best basketball because they have to because they're trying to take down a monster. Oh, most certainly. Most certainly. I it, I would have to see something different from Creighton than I have seen all season. I don't know, and, man. The last game they played, they beat the hell out of them. Yeah, but Creighton played. Uh, uh, who was it? It wasn't North Texas. Who did they beat? No, it was. Uh, shit. Now I'm curious. Hold on. Give me a second. I'm trying to get there. That's. I'm trying to remember. Did I say Villanova beat North Texas? Yeah, Villanova beat North Texas. Oh, it was Ohio. 
They uh they had yeah. to beat. Um, but hang on, Ohio is probably like one of the better lower seed teams in this thing. Uh, agreed, but uh, they had to beat UC Santa Barbara, and they beat them by. One. I don't care about that. But the, the Ohio game is what I'm talking about. The Ohio man, that Ohio team is really good. Yes, no, they certainly are. But uh, I mean, Ohio was still number 81 at Kinpom. Seem like, like you think that. Well, UC Santa Barbara metrically was better than they are. I, I picked UC Santa Barbara to upset Creighton and then to beat Ohio. Like I just uh, Ohio is is still like they're good. They got players, but you know. Uh, Ohio was still like seventeen and eight this year. Like, okay, you know. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the last game of the regular season, Ohio got beat by twenty by Buffalo, who who's not in this tournament. So, okay, you know, I, I don't know. Like, I, I, I just, I, I don't think Creighton has played nearly the competition. I think they took advantage of a weaker slate with a twelve seed and a thirteen seed uh, to get to this game. So. But either way, yeah, I'm, I'm going to take Gonzaga there. Um, moving on, we will, let's see, write my time down here first. 4 p.m. Central Time, CBS. This one's going to be awesome. Banker's Life, number four seed Florida State against number one seed Michigan. As far as I can tell, it looks like uh, looks like Isaiah Livers is not going to play again. No, I don't think, I was about to say, I don't think he's playing. There were some people talking about him trying to play. I do not think that's happening. I, even if it does, he won't be 100%, and no. I, I I don't think that this is a, a good spot for them. Florida State's length is just a mess for for anybody, and especially for Michigan in this spot with Livers out. Um, Isaiah Livers is, is one of the bigger players on the team. Without him in there, the lineup changes drastically. They they play a little more small ball than, than typically they do. Uh, and we have seen Michigan just does not look as good uh, without him I, Man, against I LSU. Know. Like against I, LSU, they shot the lights out. Yes, certainly, and that's what I'm saying. They is shot they, the lights out. Yes, but they they got hot for one game. Without Livers, they have lost to to multiple teams. I their record without him is not good over the last couple of years. Like okay. this is a senior. This is a dude that they they kind of need. Um, you know, you, you had Brown for them that averages seven points a game that went off for 21 against LSU. Like, is that going to happen again? I don't think so against Florida State. So No, but I don't think they have to. They don't have to score nearly as much to beat Florida State. Florida State's not going to score 70. Florida State's not scoring 80. I, I think they could. I mean, what Florida's wins in the tournament, Gary. Florida what State usually wins in the tournament. What usually wins in the tournament? What, what like usually defense? wins in the tournament? Defense. Guards, guards, yeah, guards, guards. Eli I'll Brooks. The team. Yeah. I'll take the team with much better guards. So yes, they're smaller. Florida State's length is fun. It's it's interesting. I don't think it. It's this is the part of the tournament where I think Florida State always falls apart because this is the part of the tournament where they start playing teams with much much better guard play. Totally fair. Um, I, and, and that, that yeah. length goes away quickly because they can't guard the three-point line, which is what this game has turned into. And Michigan Michigan can shoot the three-point ball. They don't have to be as hot as they were against LSU because Florida State's just not going to score as much as LSU score. They're just, this is not going to happen. Three-point shooting, by the way, Michigan number 11 in the country and Florida State number 16 in the country. Um, as far as three-point defense, Michigan number 112, Florida State number 105. So both of them basically a wash as far as three points go. Um, I'll take the team with the better guards, and I'm not worried about the length because, like I said, I think this is a part of the tournament where that length starts not being as important. I think when you're playing these lesser teams or smaller teams, I think it matters a lot. When you start playing big boy teams that are used to playing big boy basketball, that length doesn't matter nearly as much. And th- there is one stat that I – that I do wonder about. And we're um, a super short line. You're talking two and a half points. I'll, I'll lay the two and a half. Yeah. I'd, I, I'm going to take Florida State because I think they can win this ball game. So okay. I'm, I'm certainly going to do that. Uh, I do wonder about the, the steals, right? Uh, Michigan, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't allow steals at all. Their offense nope. just does not turn it over. Uh, nope. Florida State does. However, Michigan is number 337 at stealing the basketball. Like, they don't get steals. 
which is yeah, but they don't, crazy. but they don't lose steals either, so it doesn't. Yeah, matter. so that's a wash also. Yeah, it's I, I just like I you're not going to take it away from that. That's what killed LSU is LSU just could not get an extra possession at the end of the game. So once they were down, it was they over. Could they couldn't catch up because they were hitting threes and they couldn't steal the ball. The to biggest get an extra possession. The biggest difference between these two is tempo. Uh, Florida State is number eighty nine. So they they yeah. kind of like to uh, to speed this slow thing up a little game. bit, yeah. But but Michigan number two forty six really yeah, slow. They're, like yeah, they're gonna they're gonna run a half court offense. Yeah, I'm. They're gonna that's what and that's I'll tell you this that's what they did to LSU. Yeah, they got LSU in the half court offense, which LSU can't score that way. All right, they yeah. they have to score in transition. They they stopped the transition because LSU couldn't steal the ball because Michigan doesn't turn it over very often, and and so. They just they they brought them into half court. They slowed the game down, and then when they get into their half court offense, LSU couldn't come close to stopping them. Yeah, and yeah. I don't. And, and now, obviously, Florida State's substantially better defensively than LSU is. I still don't think they're going to stop them. You might be right. Um, as far as average height and whatnot goes, Florida State number one uh, well, yes, in the country. Yes, they've got like four, this, or five, seven footers. Yeah, they got they got some big old boys. So. Uh, I'm curious if that will make a, a big time difference. Um, I mean, it did for USC against Kansas, but I think Michigan has got some pros and Kansas did not. Yeah, yeah. This this could get interesting. Could get interesting. So I, I do think I'm, it'll be a fun matchup. It'll be a fun game. Oh, it's going to be because of the matchup. Because the styles make fights. I I just think we're getting to the point where I'm I'm taking the teams where I trust the guard play. I'll tell you this. And, I, I and think, I'll tell you this. I like the coaching matchup, man. I, 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 I Michigan, Michigan just looked much better than I thought in their first three games so far. Well, two games so far. Phil Martelli. I, I've said this before on our show. Phil Martelli was the best hire no, any no team question. could have made. He is, as far as an assistant coach goes, especially for a first-time head coach. Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Phil Martelli's been around forever. Like he's he is great at the X's and O's. Jawan Howard can get the kids in there, and he already knows a lot about like the NBA game and whatnot. I well, think he's a good and, teacher but it's anyway. Not just recruiting. I think Dewan Howard. Dewan Howard. I think Dewan Howard has outcoached. I mean, he definitely outcoached the shit out of Will Wade. Yes. Yes. I mean, he imposed so. his will over over LSU and and didn't let LSU impose their will over him. Agreed. He didn't make any mistakes. He called all the right plays. He called all the right timeouts. He, I mean, I, I think he's, I think he's out coaching a lot of these guys that have been doing it a far longer than him. I don't think he's just one of these. Well, I'm going to be the recruiter and I'm going to hire somebody else to coach. Situations. I think he knows what he's doing. Oh yeah, no, the game has changed big time because he was able to bring the NBA mentality and and the more efficient shots and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. No, and he's, he brought he's it. Definitely yeah. changed the way Michigan played basketball. Most certainly, it's uh, it, it's, it's not a far cry from what it was under Beheim. I I don't know that it's a a far cry from that, but it's it it is definitely different. Uh, they're still know, incredibly think, think, efficient. Think, they they like, just look different to me. But maybe maybe I don't know. A lot I, of that a lot of that has to do with the the kind of players that they got right now. Like, true, that's right. They, it could they be got the some athletes dudes. they have that they didn't used to have. Beeline didn't get those guys. Beeline had uh, the very, like the guys that would do what he told them to do, right? That's right. And and Juwan has he got athletes, athletes that do what no, he, he tells got, them. He to got do. dudes. Yep, you have got that right. And they know, and they and th- these dudes are smart. They know this game. Oh, they you, understand how this game should be played. You have got that right. You have got that right. Uh, it it would not surprise me either one of these teams winning. I would love to see Leonard Hamilton make it to another Elite Eight, maybe to a Final Four. Uh, but it wouldn't surprise me if he gets beaten. So, moving on from there, 6.15 p.m. Central Time on TBS in Hinkle, 11 seed UCLA, who has had to win three games to get here against two seed Alabama. Uh, this is stylistically a fantastic and fascinating matchup. I've, I've yep. said that before already, but this is another one of those. Uh, Alabama number 11 in tempo, UCLA number 337, one of the slowest teams in the country. Alabama is 11 from the top, and UCLA is 10 from the bottom. I mean, it's yep. <laughs> you cannot get any further apart on how these teams actually play. Um, the question for this game, can Johnny Juzang 
uh, continue his hot streak. He's averaging over 22 points in this tournament. He averaged less than 15 a game throughout the season. They are a different team right now once they got into this tournament. Like, they, they had lost four straight. Now, all of those were to Oregon State, Colorado, Oregon, USC, like all of the... All, all tournament teams. Yes. All tournament teams and all really, really good teams. As, all tournament as has teams been that won a game. Yes. Yes, you are correct. And three of those are in are, the Sweet are still 16. still playing. Yeah. That's right. Only Colorado did not make it to the Sweet 16. So, yeah. You are correct about that. So, uh, you know, they had a four-game losing streak. They were all pretty close. And they get into the tournament. They get an opportunity against Michigan State. They beat Michigan State. Then they go and play BYU. They beat BYU. A good BYU team, too. Yep. Real and good BYU team that a lot I, of people thought was going to handle that. I thought BYU was going to be in the Sweet 16. That's, yeah. that's what I, I know. I know a lot of people did. They man, they just could not shoot against. They had open looks against UCLA, but uh, but they could not shoot for whatever reason. So, but that's the way it goes. That is the way it goes sometimes. Um, Nate Oates has never been to a Sweet Sixteen. This is his first one, and although Cronin has been at this for a long, long time, uh, this is only his second one. He only did it once at Cincinnati. That was in yeah. his second season. Uh, did not make it further than that. So, a win here for either of these guys would be a first time ever. Um, the biggest thing here. UCLA, um, you know, at number 198 in three-point percentage defense, Alabama's going to get open looks. Can they knock them down again? Like, it, that's a, a big question here because Alabama has proven that they can win games even without hitting the threes. It's almost impossible for the other team to be able to stop them if, if Alabama's knocking them down. Uh, UCLA has been hot from three lately. Juzang and all those guys have have really kind of been lighting it up. Alabama's length might be a problem here. Alabama's number eight in the country defending the three, and they're pretty good in two point defense as well. Um, you know, I what I'm curious about Alabama can turn the ball over a lot. Now they haven't. Uh, there's only been five games this entire season where they have turned it over less than ten times a game. Four of those have come in March. Like, in the NCAA tournament, they are not turning it over. They they look like a different team as far as taking care of the basketball. Um, UCLA is number 17 in offensive steal percentage. That's where a lot of Alabama's points come from. Like, they they make people turn the football or turn the uh, basketball over. And I, you know, I everything about this tells me that Alabama uh, should be able to run away with this thing. But UCLA is hot right now. And these are two incredibly different teams with the way that they want. It's whoever's going to be able to impose their will. That's it. Like I, I don't think UCLA has played a team like Alabama other than no. Oregon this year. And in no. Oregon, I think when Oregon is healthy, and that's when UCLA played them. Uh, Oregon and Alabama very similar teams, I think, uh, as far as ath- athletes go. So, you know, I it, because I'm a homer, I'll take Alabama. I don't know how I feel about it. Like this is this is very much a toss up to me because Cronin's got those, those boys playing really really well. They're playing uh, very um, together. Their chemistry is great right now. Yeah. So. Well, I'll continue to set money on fire betting against Alabama, but I'm going to do that. <laughs> that uh, I'd rather lose money and keep my soul. I can I can understand. I can understand. I enjoyed your uh, your solo podcast the other day, by the way. Yeah. So yeah, the, I'm sure I appreciate it. It was it was good. It's all it's it all good. roses for you and all. Kicking the dick to me. That's all right. <laughs> the uh, what would you say? It was the slap in the penis that uh, that you did not need. <laughs> it yeah. was really good. Yeah, really yeah. good. I was really counting on Maryland. I needed I needed Maryland to pick me up bad. And as soon as I flipped over in that game, I thought, son of a bitch. Definitely, uh, definitely not good, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> all right. Last game of Sunday evening. That would be seven seed Oregon against six seed US, uh, USC. 8.45 p.m. Central Time on TBS. It's at Banker's Life. This is the Pac-12 bout, right? USC beat Oregon 72-58 on February 22nd. Uh, Oregon, however, is healthy now. Definitely a good thing. We showed what they're capable of. I don't believe that they are going to be able to do the same thing against USC that they did against Iowa. I mean, they scored 95 points in that game. It was like 1.5 points per possession. Just absurd. Pretty insane. Absolutely absurd. The, this defense that USC is going to bring is just a just a smidge better than Iowa. Uh, just a little bit. Um, a, USC a, has the number five 
adjusted defensive efficiency in the country. Yeah. Uh, Iowa was number 75. Yeah, they're pretty, Big they're pretty good. Big they're difference. pretty good. And nobody has paid attention to this at all. USC is up to number six in the country at Ken Palm. Like, yeah. they they have the dudes. The Mosley brothers are just uh, nobody. I wouldn't want to play them. There's, there, uh, listen, Gonzaga's pretty damn glad that USC's not in, you know, not in their bracket. Well, but, they uh, but they are. But they don't have to play them right now. You know no, what I'm no, saying? No. They, like, they would just have to play them in the next, next game. If they get through Creighton. But, yeah, like, this is one of those situations where there's not a team that wants to play USC. I don't think. I think I they're don't the think scariest either. team left in the bracket. Uh, I do agree with that. I mean, because they have of got... the way they stop you on defense. And here's, here's on, the deal. Just on offense, they're, they're just – I feel like either one of the Mosleys can score – Every possession? Yeah, the Evan Mobley and Isaiah Mobley are unreal. Now, Evan Mobley is like, he's the guy, right? Well, yeah, no, he's he's he, substantially better than Isaiah. But Isaiah is coming into his own, man. This last couple of games, that oh, dude yeah. is... No, he's, he's, he's in great. He's definitely not shy. No, it's it, against Kansas for sure. I mean, he... Like that was a ridiculous game. Yes. Like the yeah. the step back threes and all that. Like that's just something else. At, at no point in time, it looked like they were toying with Kansas because they were. Yes. They no, were toying with them. Um, it, they have got one dude that really plays that's under six seven. USC does. I mean, it's it's absurd the length that they've got. It's just yeah, they're long and they're crazy athletic though. Yes. They're not just long and just gonna sit down at the paint. They can guard. There's a reason they're number five in the country at defense. Wait, you, they're going to you know, guard the perimeter better than anybody else in the tournament. What What is defense hey, on it on its face? What is defense? It's effort. Well, yo, yeah, like it's, it's, yeah, and yeah, you, yes, you have got 100%. dudes that play for USC that give a crap and actually want to defend. But Oregon's got kind of the same thing, right now. No, Oregon's they, got athletes. Oh, Oregon yeah. overall, from top to bottom, Oregon's more athletic than USC. But yeah. I, this matchup's gonna be fun. I think, and I hate this is what I bothered by by this thing. I hate that they changed this from Friday Saturday to Saturday Sunday. So now you got a bunch of folks that are gonna gonna. This game's gonna be late. Half the country's not gonna watch it. They're gonna be dragging ass into work the next day. But if it was on a Saturday night at ten o'clock, everybody would be watching it. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. Instead, it'd, it'd everybody a, be watching a huge number. They'll be watching Syracuse and Houston instead. Um. But, you know, I, I still think there's going to be a lot of people watching this game. You know, it's 9 p.m. Central Time. I think it's going to be fine. Uh, here is the... So, there's a lot of length difference here. Yeah. USC, we just talked about, you know, yep. a lot of 6'7", 6'9", 6'9", 6'10", 7'0", whatever. Uh, Oregon is is long, but in a different way, right? It's 6'6", 6'6", 6'6", 6'6", 6'5", 6'2", 6'8". Like, that's it. That's it. Like, <laughs> that's their dudes. So they got guards that are that are long, but they don't really have anybody down low that can bang with Mobley. So I think the I think the biggest thing here is going to be uh, experience. Uh, Oregon has a bunch of seniors on this team. Uh, USC, like I think the X factor here is Taj Edie. If if Edie can get going and he can start hitting some threes and he can really space the floor, I I think that's. I mean, this will be a runaway for USC. I, this line is only two. Yeah, it's one and a half at at Bet Online. Let's see, one and a yeah, that's the only book that has it one and a half. At is Bavada, it? Bookmaker, Heritage, Intertops, UH, everything else is two. Um. But I, I think I'm going to roll with USC. Yeah, I am like too. I, I just, I mean, I, it's just, it's too short of a line. I think they're the better team. The, do you think that yes, they're the Oregon's better got a lot team. of guards? I don't know that Oregon's guards are better than USC though. Like that's the thing. I think I think USC is going to defend the perimeter better than anybody else left in the tournament. Here, here's what I'm scared of. I'm scared of USC being so young because they they got a ton of young dudes. Sure, and. The coaching match. So it's, you're you're talking about seniors against freshmen, and you're talking about Dana Altman against Andy Enfield. Who do I trust more? Do I trust Dana Altman with a bunch of seniors, or do I trust Andy Enfield with a bunch of freshmen? I know who has the more the more talent, and I know who the bigger guys are. And I, I mean, in my my head is telling me that you have to take USC here. 
I need, I need, so norm, you know how much I like coaches, right? Yeah. And if there's a transcendent player on the other side and the great coach team doesn't have like that real transcendent player to match up with them, I, that's hard. At some point in time, coaching matters, but the dudes on the floor matter more. That's a, that's a good point. I, yeah. If we're, if we were, if we were old school basketball, you know, drafting teams, picking teams on the, on the, uh, uh, on the playground. I, I think you're taking two USC guys before you take the first Oregon guy. And there's a chance you're taking three of the top four from USC. Yeah. I mean, the, the top three guys for Oregon are all seniors, but I, I do think, I mean, Isaiah Mobley's a sophomore. Um, Evan Mobley's a freshman. Taj Edie's a senior. Yeah, so he's good. a senior, and he's the guy that really runs the defense too. Yeah, you know? I mean he he's the guy that kind of gets those guys. You know, he's he's going to be the one to bring the effort and, and and make sure everybody's carrying their weight. I I just I just think three out of the top four guys are going to all if you if we're just drafting players who you want to take, I think you're taking three USU guys to one to one Oregon guy at some point in time. That's going to outrun coaches. It just is. Yeah. Yeah, but it's my opinion. We've seen the the other team win. I mean, we just talked about a million different ways. If if Oregon gets hot and Oregon's just shoot USC can't defend, you know, just step back threes over and over and over again. I just don't think they're going to be able to run. The only way Oregon's winning this game is if they hit threes, because I and USC guards the three point line really well, but. I don't think they're getting the half court offense, and I don't think they're running efficient half court offenses against USC. I see. Defense had- doesn't usually fold in the tournament. If you're really good at defense, it's why defense usually wins tournaments. Because if you're really good at defense, sometimes you can hit, sh- hit shots, sometimes you don't. But rarely does your defense not show up. No, that that is true. That is it's the uh, most consistent true. thing in March. Um, it, it's. Speaking of that three-point defense, uh, USC number 160 in three-point defense. Oregon is number 15 in the country in three-point percentage. So, Oh, wow. So, yeah, we're going to – so that's Oregon's but, that, that's that is Oregon's way to stay in this game and win it. Yeah, because they, they can space the floor. They can get, you know, the yeah. Mobley brothers out from the paint and make them have to defend. And does that open up the paint a little bit? Yeah. Uh, maybe. You know, I – I don't think it's going to open the paint. I think they're just going to hit threes. They, they will have to hit them. They will certainly have to hit them. Uh, you know, I'm it'll gonna, be a fantastic game. I will tell you that. I do. I don't see this being a runaway either side. I don't see USC running Oregon out of the gym. I don't see. I don't, I don't just don't think this game's going to get double digits on you either way. I'm gonna. I might be wrong on that. I'm gonna take. You know what? I'm swapping. I'm. I'm You're gonna take Oregon. Oregon. Yeah. Okay. I'm gonna take Oregon. I rarely do. I go up against the the team that I think is worst coach, but I'm going to take USC. I think you've got two stars that are really good. No, that, that makes perfect Obviously sense. Obviously one, one is transcendent and the guy that we could be when this whole thing is over with holding the trophy saying, how did, have we missed this guy? This is the best tournament. In, this is the best player in the country. And we, you know, we're just now realizing it. Now you're, you're right. I mean, I think that guy shows up all the time and, and there's a really good chance that it could be him. And that, you, you may, you may have a valid point there. You may have a valid point. All right, let's move off. Let's jump into UFC 260. Now, we ain't going to spend a long time on this because I don't know a ton about these guys. However, we're going to give out some picks and whatnot. We'll talk about what's going on uh, because this is a, a pretty big pay-per-view. Uh, the main fight is... Are you getting this fight? I'm debating it. I am debating it. I I really want to. But I know I'm I'm going to have basketball on one of the other screens. Am I going to have basketball on my main screen? And do I want to pay $75 to watch one fight that could be over in just a few seconds? I'll go and have these with you. But I don't know how your your other people that live in your house care about that, though. I think, now, I think we could probably make that happen. If I had multiple screens, I'd say you come over here. And I've, I've got the screen. You see my screen. You've got you the multiple screen situation. I don't have that's, that. I've, uh, got, I've got one big ass screen. That's that's interesting. That's uh, you know what? We'll we'll I will discuss that. I'll figure that out. So I think that could be possible. And so, okay. um, so UFC two sixty on Saturday night. We are only going to talk about the three main fights. That's fine. Sugar Sean O'Malley 
is a uh, a minus three ten favorite over Thomas Almeida, and the with the way that O'Malley was knocked out, not that long ago, that was a, we watched I, that fight. Yeah, I I don't think that it is even a question. No, I, I don't I think, think there's any way he's losing two in a row. Yeah, I think O'Malley handles this one, and I think he handles it easily. Um, the under one and a half is plus one ten, and I think I might take that. And like it's, it's yeah, I would probably take that over laying the two twenty uh, three twenty is what I saw. Yeah, it, I've, I'm seeing three ten on this other book. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there there are other props and whatnot. Like, uh, let's see. What's the knockout prop? I'm sure that's not going to be much different than 320. Uh, O'Malley by KO. Uh, TKO or disqualification is plus 135. Holy cow. That's the only way he wins, I think. I was about to say, do they think he's going to submit this guy? I doubt it because... They think it's going to go to the decision? O'Malley by submission is 700. Like, plus 700. Um, I mean, I think that would be the way to go. 310 for him to win... Anyway, and then plus one thirty five for him to <laughs> plus one thirty five for him to knock him out, which means they think it's going to a decision. Uh, well, a, a draw here would be well. O'Malley by decision is, uh, let's see, uh, plus two fifty. That can't he can't be plus. He shouldn't be plus anything for winning if he's minus three twenty to win. He's minus three ten to win. He is plus one uh, twenty five, uh, d- 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 one thirty five. Sorry, by KO, TKO, or disqualification by submission plus seven hundred. Um, yeah, I, you know, that makes no sense at all. That I mean, make, I, the math on that makes no make sense. any sense. Yeah. Well, I, no, that's where you pound the you pound the plus one thirty five. Yes. Just pound the shit out of it, which uh, which I just did. I wouldn't even care about the over. I, I wouldn't even care about the over under anymore. I don't care if he does it. Fat. He's just not. We're just not going to a decision. I don't think. I no. I, I seriously doubt that. I mean, there's a reason why the over under, as far as rounds, is is one and a half. Yeah. You know, like at no, under. But 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 if I can get plus odds on him knocking his ass out in the second or the third round, I'm I'm fine with that. And so under one and a half is plus one ten. To go over one and a half rounds is minus one forty. So they think it'll go at least into the second round. Um, yeah, that. But, but I'm not I, worried about that. I, but either. I get plus one thirty five to knock him out. That's the only way he's winning. Yeah, I agree. That's I insane. Agree. Unless unless there's something screwy and we don't know it, we'll find out Saturday. We will certainly find out Saturday. We will certainly find out. Uh, moving on the the next one, Tyron Woodley against uh, Vicente Luque, and Luque is a minus two thirty favorite, and this dude has been. Uh, I want to say on fire. Uh, in 2020, he had two wins, and they were both KOs, uh, doctor yep. stoppage, and one by knee and punch. He knocked out Nico Price. He knocked out Randy Brown, and they were, uh, I mean, the, the one against Randy Brown was a performance of the night. He got a big-time bonus. Like, it's it's awesome. Uh, he did lose to uh, Steven Thompson, you know, Wonder Boy, uh, but that was back in November 2019. Before that, uh, he had won, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. So he's won eight of his last nine fights. He's he's moving on up, man. It, Tyron Woodley, uh, not great. Not great as of late. Uh, for whatever reason, like, Woodley has, has kind of lost it. And, I mean, there's a reason why uh, Woodley is a plus 180 underdog here. I, I don't know what's happened to him. I mean, he, I, I know I know that he's gotten old. You know, he's uh, he's 38 years old. Yeah, I was about to say, but, you, know, you got almost a decade difference in age. Yeah, I mean, it, Woodley has lost three straight, uh, but he lost to Kamara Usman, Gilbert Burns, and Colby Covington. So, and all of them, he, uh, let's see, he lost da, 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 two of them by decision, and against Covington, uh, he lost uh, via TKO because of a rib injury. Yeah. And that was back in September. Like I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go Luke. Yeah, I don't, I don't like laying points against a striker. I think you can, you know, and there's a world where Woodley will catch you, and and I saw it at plus two hundred five. But I, I would either, you, you got to take Luke or, or or not. I mean, you got a decade of age difference. Luke by decision is plus one fifty. By KO, he is plus two seventy five. 
Okay. That's and, how you can get some odds. Yeah. Woodley by decision is plus 330. Woodley by KO is plus 550. I about to say, I bet that's huge. Yeah. It's it's on up there. So, I'm I'm going to take Luke A by, by KO and, and go with the plus 275. Um, because I just, I think that Woodley has lost it. Like, I know he wants to get it back and whatnot, but I don't think this now, is the I'll dude to get this, it back. There's against. a world where if you get plus 250 and then plus 500, and you think it's going to end in a KO, I, you know, you kind of hedge and you, you kind of bet them, you kind of bet them both because I don't think we're going to a decision. I don't think so either. I don't think, I think so either. I think, I think Woodley's only chance of winning is to knock him out. Yeah. Which is why, you know, which is why I don't think we're going to a decision because at some point in time when you get desperate, try to start knocking the guy out, you either knock him out or he knocks you out. Yes. Because yes. you open yourself up. I, I, you know, the, the play would be the fight end in a knockout, which I don't know what the odds would be on that instead of betting both of them. Uh, but I'm sure it's positive odds. Um, I don't see... I don't see an odd for or, that. Or you just bet both of them. Both of by them by KO. And, and know, know that you're getting positive odds no matter what. Yeah, that would that would kind of make sense. So. That would kind of make sense. Um, last fight of the night. This is the big one. Stipe Miokic against Francis Ngannou. Uh, these are two big old boys. I mean, they are massive guys. Um, Stipe minus 105. Francis Ngannou is minus 125. Uh, as got, of right now, I got Stipe at plus one eighteen before I, we start to show it. Bet online. That's I got him earlier today at plus one ten, yeah. and I think a lot of people realized. Oh wait a minute, Stipe is an underdog here. Yeah, like Stipe, Stipe yeah. is catching positive odds. He's the champ. I think he's the best fighter in the world. I'm a little biased. I do not believe that that this one will go to a decision. I don't believe no. either guy will be submitted in this. No. This is a knockout fight. That's uh, right. I would like to see what Stipe's knockout po- uh, odds are. Plus 200. Okay, so I'll take that. Plus 200, and Nganu is minus 120 yeah. to win by knockout. So everybody thinks that Nganu is going to win this fight. That tells you, That tells you. yeah, Vegas thinks that Nganu's going to win it. Well, yes and no. Uh, they just, Nganu is a knockout artist, right? Like, he, he has become this... Massive. I mean, he's he's won just however many fights in a row in the first round. Uh, four the last four fights that he's won, he's knocked out his opponent in the first round. Uh, one in forty five seconds, one in twenty six seconds, one in twenty seconds, one in one minute and eleven seconds. That was Junior Dos Santos, uh, Rosenstruck. He knocked out Kane Velasquez. He knocked out Blades Curtis Blades. He knocked out. Um, however, back in twenty eighteen, he had a two fight losing streak where. He got knocked out, uh, or no, sorry, sorry, sorry. Both of these went to decision. Um, Stipe actually went to decision with him, and I think Stipe is going to knock him out this time. I don't, I, 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 I don't I think he can hang. Biased, though. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, you're a little biased, but I, I just think Stipe is the better overall fighter, man. I think he's like, the best fighter in the world. In the world? In the world. Okay. Okay, I can, I might could deal with that. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to rank guys outside of your weight class, but if you tell me one of those little guys fight these heavyweights, I think these heavyweights beat the shit out of them. Well, so. that's that's a very, that's a valid point. So if you're the that's best a- heavyweight in the world, you're you're, <laughs> you're usually oftentimes the best fighter in the world. That's a that's a very valid point. Uh, I am I'm gonna roll steep a plus two hundred. For the knockout, yeah, I can't. For the knockout, yeah, yeah, I can't. I couldn't believe when I saw he was positive. I kind of was expecting minus one ten both ways, because I just thought the books would have this as an even fight. Now, it, with shocked. Ngannou's four straight first round knockouts, like everybody thinks he's on yeah, a warpath. Yeah, but ain't none of those dudes steep, a. Eh? No, but they. I mean, it's still good dudes. Oh, all like, right, all right, that's fine. I mean, it's a, he. He has fought the best of the best, and that. I mean, there's a reason. Why he hadn't he, fought the best of the best. He, he did, and that guy beat him. He has well, that's true. That was back in uh, January of 2018. Uh, yeah, but so. he he has not fought since May 9th of 2020 because there was nobody else in the heavyweight division for him. I was about to say there's just no, he he's already ran through everybody. Yeah, Velasquez, Blades, Santos, and Rosenstruck. So, yeah, um, I mean he he's been killing people, just killing them. I, uh, I understand, but that. I, I don't yeah, think he's gonna do he's that. He's a bad man. I'm listen. I wouldn't wouldn't say a negative word about it to his face, okay? But if Stipe was there, 
I talk all the shit I want. <laughs> I like it. I like it. All right, we have gone long. Let's go ahead and get out of here. Um, winningcureseverything.com is the website. sbrpicks.com slash NCAAF is our college football gambling site. So go and check that bad boy out. Make sure you are subscribed everywhere you need to be subscribed. All that good stuff. Chris, is there anything else we need to hit on? No, brother. Let's get out of here. I am ready for some fights, and I am ready for some college basketball. Let's get this sweet, uh, sweet, 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 sweet 16 action rolling. You guys have been great. Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. Hopefully, all of your bets cash this weekend. Thanks for checking out Winning Cures Everything. If you want to keep up with us, hit subscribe on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Visit the website at winningcureseverything.com or you can like us on Facebook or follow us at Winning Cures, at Gary WCE, or at Chris B. Giannini on Twitter. Share out the show, leave a nice review, and make sure to comment and tweet at us.